Good morning. So everyone had coffee, hopefully. Okay, so uh, interesting to be presenting in this room at this event because seven years ago I was here and uh, back then Half was was in very early stages. So it's I'm glad to be here talking about what we've done in the past seven years. Uh, I hope everyone knows what basically Half was does. Who who knows? Who doesn't? Come on. Really? Okay, for those of you who claim you don't know, I have a separate deck. Uh, Harpoth takes Unicode characters and a font and renders it correctly. That's what it does. Okay, back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's this piece of open type called open type layout, uh, which uh, that's the major addition of open type on top of uh, true type, and that's where all the complex logic comes in. Before true type and type one could render Latin or any other what we call simple script, but when you had Arabic or Indic or any other complex script, they didn't handle it. So open type layout was the layer added to open type to handle the complex script, and uh, back in early late 90s, early 2000s, there was an implementation of the open type layout tables, also known as GSOP, GPAS, GDEF, uh, their table tag, that went into free type, but then pulled out because uh, it's out of scope for free type. Free type is a rasterizer and doesn't uh, have to implement these things. At the same time, uh, GNOME and KDE wanted to add support for complex scripts, so they copied this free type layout code into Penguin Qt, and uh, let me also add that the free type layout code or the open type layout tables are just the basis. You then have to implement uh, script specific shapers on top of that. For example, Arabic has its own shaper. Then all of the 10, 12 uh, index scripts have their own shapers. And then uh, you have, I don't know, Thai has a shaper, Hangul has a shaper, Hebrew has a shaper. Every major script has a shaper and these shapers were developed by Microsoft in the 2000s and are not officially part of OpenType well they are part of yeah they are part of OpenType but uh, Microsoft drove those and Penguin Q they started implementing those so they copied the free type layout code but they started implementing these shapers on top there's one more implementation I forgot to add ICU also had it so so by the time I got to, uh, to Red Hat, which is 2006, uh, I was tasked to maintain all these different shaping, shaping, shapers. Uh, my typical day, I would receive bugs from the Red Hat internationalization team that this specific index font with this sequence works in GNOME, but not KD and not Open Office, or it works in Open Office and GNOME, but not in KDE. And then it was a nightmare to debug and uh, handle. And worse, it wasn't clear if it's a font bug or a software bug. So in 2000, uh, 2006, a startup year, I moved all this F free type layout code out of Pango and called it half buzz. And then the idea was at least we can start sharing that with Qt with a plan to share, merge and share the shaper code as well. But then at the end of the year, I figured that the FTL code is old and crafty and has some major issues that I can fix by just rewriting it. And I talk about that in a second. And then early in 2007, uh, QT Trolltech uh, donated their shapers to Harfbuzz. So by then Harfbuzz was a complete shaping engine, but it was very crafty. And that's what we call Harfbuzz old from now on. And it died a graceful uh, death in 2012. And what I started end of 2006 called Harfbuzz NG is what we call Harfbuzz these days. And that's what I talk about. 
So the goals that I set for this rewrite was first API should be user friendly because with the old half was you really had to know what open type is and how it works to be able to make sense of it. I wanted it to be robust uh, against bad fonts and against bad input because the old code wasn't. I wanted it to be efficient and one of the major efficiency things I wanted to do is I wanted to and map the font file and use it and instead of parsing it into memory. And that turned out to be a major improvement because the old code was parsing all these tables into memory and for a regular file like Roboto or Deja Vu, that could easily add up to 500k. And that's a 500k of per process memory that I'm not consuming by just m mapping font and using it directly. And uh, I wanted to be thread safe because the old code wasn't. I wanted to be portable. The old code was tied to free type. I wanted this to be usable on every platform. And I wanted to implement the, all the latest and greatest uh, features of OpenType. So 2007, 2008, I was at the, on the Red Hat desktop team and while I could work on half, but my manager wanted to, me to also do something else. So I spent a lot of time optimizing. The same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Red Hat. <laughs> so this period, I was optimizing the GNOME login performance, if some of you remember. And then uh, in early 2009, I called my manager at Red Hat. I said, you know what? I think I should quit and join Mozilla and work on half, but he said, is that all you want to work on half I said, yes. He said, OK, go do it. So I picked it up again. And so 2009, a lot of commits went in. And I started pairing with Jonathan Q at Mozilla on improving half -wise. And this proved to be the best, uh, the most productive collaboration I ever had. And it's continued for many years. So we paired in 2009. Uh, at the Mozilla Toronto office. And I think that was when I extracted the code from Pango and moved it into a new module and it started to come together. And then we were at the WebKit GTK Hackfest. At the end of the year, I remember it was the end of the year because my luggage got lost and I had three weeks of travel after uh, to continue for the holidays. Fortunately, I found my luggage when flying out. It was just sitting in the airport. So we continued this, uh, this pattern of meeting with Jonathan in different places in the world and working on this. And in 2010, Firefox started, was the earliest adopter. It started shipping Harfuss and calling it for some scripts, for the simple scripts, and uh, for scripts that we knew it's better than Windows. Like for Latin, uh, this enabled Firefox to ship uh, you know, the CSS font feature settings before anyone else, because uh, for Latin, Harf was, was working better than Windows. But uh, yeah, so you see there's a gap again between 2010 and 2012. I joined Google and also my manager wanted me to work on half but he wanted me to work on something else as well. So that's when I, I branched off and worked on Glyphy and OpenGL rasterization for a while. And then I came back to half but again, trying to finish it. And the major part missing at this time was the index shaper. And the index shaper is the most complicated and most complex part of OpenType. It's under specified by both Unicode and OpenType. And worse, it's not one script. It's over 10 different scripts that are similar, but slightly different. So I, I, I read all the Unicode docs and all the OpenType and all the old, old uh, shapers we had. And I started putting together one. And I found that I can actually get some of the Unicode data uh, and feed it into the shaper, that would solve some of the problems. But then again, I had limited tests and that was just not enough. I had no confidence that this is good or this is bad. So it took a while to learn that 
because the index shaping is so under specified, whatever Microsoft does is the spec. We want funds to behave exactly the same way. So that's when we started comparing half of output to, uh, to Windows output. So what we did is we downloaded all of, uh, so I went to Ruth by my colleague and said, hey, we are Google, I want you to download the entire internet and give me a word list for every language so I can be sure that I render them all correctly. But we settled for Wikipedia. So we downloaded all of Wikipedia for every language and generated a word list. And it's a very small word list for, for Hindi, for example, it's about one million words. And we released all of that on uh, GitHub and other places. But the nice thing about this is I can shape all of the words in Hindi Wikipedia using Windows and using Harfbuzz that takes like a few seconds. And then compare them. And just count the number of mismatches. And then we go patch something. We look at the diff. This is a sample diff. We look at the diff, identify the issue, go fix it, rerun the test suite for all the 12 scripts, and look at the numbers. So these, uh, these ended up being extremely useful. So Jonathan and I will get into the same place for a week, or sometimes even two days or one day, I start looking at this, push the numbers down a bit, go away for a few months, get together, push them back down again. So the first time we met, like, we got the failures for them one arguing from 35% to 8 in 10,000. So out of all of Wikipedia, only 560 words were not shaping the same. Next time, we pushed it down to 56. And then from there on, sometimes you see numbers going up because when you get that close, you start discovering bugs in the Uniscribe shaper, Windows shaper. And then sometimes we try to match those, sometimes we, we decide to do separately. And then when we did that, we also implemented Myanmar shaping, which is uh, different. Microsoft did that in Windows 8.1, so we just did the same. And then, uh, because we had this model that we were using a, a state matching generator to go from a grammar, a regular expression like grammar like this, to a big complex state machine, which in the previous paper used to be handwritten. So this was one of the major achievements of the new code, that it was readable, and we were getting the Unicode data into it. So we figured that we do this for all the Indic scripts and for the Myanmar, we can do it for the, all the other, like tens of smaller scripts in Unicode that Microsoft and OpenType doesn't have any shaper for right now. So we started doing what, something we call the Southeast Asian shaper. So 2012, uh, Lots of Hackfest with Jonathan, I switched Pango over, and Chrome OS and Chrome Linux finally actually switched based on work that started here uh, three years earlier. And then we also poured the ICU layout. So 2013, uh, Android switched uh, with little problem. Uh, Rafe Levine and I got into the same room for two days and it just magically happened. There was no major surprises, no bugs coming in. Actually, bug reports went down. So sometime in 2014, after all that Indic testing and measurements and Jonathan running uh, a mega corpus of every font, every language, all of Wikipedia uh, testing on Amazon AWS, that gave him the confidence that this is better than Windows Shaper. So Firefox switched to using Harfbuzz on every platform for every language or script. And then uh, another major achievement came in 2014 when Chrome was porting to use DirectWrite and they didn't have a DirectWrite shape code to use the DirectWrite shape it. So ML was lazy. I said, well, we have this code that 
uses half bus and it works on its platform independent. How about I just use that for now until we write the direct right shaper? So they, start, they switched to half bus and window then never looked back. It actually gave them a, something like a three or four times uh, speed up of page load on certain pages. And then sometime in 2015, we switched Mac over, Chrome Mac over. And then, remember back, uh, I said we had this Southeast Asia shaper, which wasn't in open type, we just did it because it was simple. Like, the grammar was there, the data from Unicode was there, so we just did what, what naturally will follow. And in 2014, I asked, colleagues at Microsoft and Apple and Adobe and other experts to meet and discuss the future of open type shape it. And in that room, uh, we, we did brainstorm a lot of things and I did present the idea that we did this. And we all agreed that it's a useful thing to shape all of the remaining Southeast Asian scripts using Unicode data. And then we agreed to work on it together and we dispersed and we didn't. And six months later at the Unicode conference, Microsoft announced something called the Universal Shaping Engine. Now Microsoft says when we met, they were already working on it, but we don't know. So that's what the Universal Shaping Engine is about. And in 2015, we implemented that in, at Mozilla London. And at that time, half was became feature complete. It had all the shapers that Windows had, and it implemented major, like every major feature of OpenTie, and then a lot of features of Unicode that we did that other shapers don't do. So since then, half was, was feature complete, and then if you look at that, after that, all the half was hackfest we do with Jaraton have been minor, like uh, update to Unicode 8, update to Unicode 9. And it's become, so when I started, the major problem we had was desktop Linux was such a, had such a small market share that no one cared about how their fonts uh, shaped with half -bite. So we were always lagging beyond, we were always getting bugs uh, from users. Now these days we are in a situation that half is in Android, Firefox on every platform, and Chrome in every platform. So that gives us a very good chunk of the web and what matters. So now half is a first, uh, you know, a, a first class citizen of people like the market. So people actually do test against it and it's been stable and happy. So since then, uh, for the past two years, I actually have been focusing on other things, uh, on a font production pipeline. So it's, it's not taking much of my time anymore. It's mature, there's bugs coming in, we fix them, but really there's not much uh, going on at the moment. But uh, HPOT font is interesting because now that we have this code base that is stable and uh, has robust and has some interesting design in it, and it's in all of the open source platforms, we have started putting some more useful code there. So HPOC font uh, implements some of the features that previously were coming from free type or the system platforms. We now put them in half buzz and Chrome and Android have started using those instead of calling through Skia to call free type to load days and then that helps removing multiple caching layers and speed things up and uh, reduce memory. But this week here, we are implementing, we just did yesterday, add parsing of the open time math table into our buzz. And there is work to put the open type color sweep and like the, some of the color formats, the Microsoft and Adobe's color font uh, tables into our buzz. And some of the variation fonts which I, which I talk about. But why these don't have anything to do with shaping? Why do we put them in half -width? Because although free type is where all the font access has been historically, that's, not, that's only on free software platforms. Whereas 
if we put things in half bars, we can use them in Chrome and Firefox in every platform. So all the things that we want to be centralized and the same code, the same font code should be used on every platform. We are now putting them in half bars. And then that takes me to variation fonts. Uh, variation fonts is again something we've been at Google working for two years now. Work has started with Microsoft, Apple, Adobe six months ago, and the results were announced at ATIPI two weeks ago. And I can do a small demo. So whereas previously fonts were scalable in that you could just change the size, with variation fonts, you can change weight and width or any other arbitrary axis at runtime. So uh, designers have been designing this way with interpolation for many years now. We just figured that instead of exporting static instances, we can just put everything into the font and do the interpolation around time. Now that has major benefits in file size. File size is important on mobile devices and for web files. And then it gives you just uh, more of the more, more uh, features, like more, you can have arbitrary instances. And then note how, for example, the dollar sign changes to a different design around here. So, uh, that's what variation fonts are, and it needs some support in half buzz, which is already done, but we are also in going to put something called an instantiator or mutator that in half buzz that takes a variable, variable font and extracts an instance at a certain coordinate. So on platforms like older Windows and Mac that don't support this, you can actually instantiate the font and pass it to the renderer such that like Firefox and Chrome can implement and ship something like variation fonts on older platforms. That's similar to how Firefox does color fonts, like they support Microsoft style color fonts on Windows versions that don't support color fonts. So this is a, by putting these, these pieces of code in half buzz, the browsers can uh, ship features that are independent of the platform. And that's something that we've been seeing with Firefox with shaping engines as well, right? For example, for Myanmar, you have Firefox or Chrome on a Windows XP, you can render Myanmar whereas the, the system doesn't. So that's what we've been doing and uh, probably continue doing for a while. And other than that, I don't know what's next. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question was last year, someone from the Chrome team was explaining how, well, in, in Chrome and in Blink and WebKit, there are two text rendering paths. There's like a simple path, which is no shaping, which just advances. And there's the complex path, which is heartless. Mm -hmm. And they were explaining how they were doing some work to eliminate the simple path and to just use heartless, which is really cool. But uh, they said that they needed to do a lot of like extra caching to make this work, to make this fast in in, uh, in Chrome. And I don't know if you could talk about that kind of caching or if that's something that kind of caching can actually go, is going on with buzz or I don't know. Sure. So the question is, uh, Chrome wanted to switch to not using the simple paths, uh, but they had to do some caching. What's the status or what are my thoughts? That's true. So WebKit initially had two code passes, one called the simple pass that doesn't do any shaping, so it only works for Latin and CJK with no ligature, no curating, and then the complex or slow pass that uses half pass. So Firefox got rid of any kind of a slow pass way like before, like in 2010-12, by adding a word cache 
And Android did the same. Android has a word cache and always uses half buzz. And Chrome, it took longer, but we did that. Like, latest Chrome has no simple code path anymore. But yes, we, you end up needing some kind of caching because uh, half buzz is already very fast compared to other shapers, like many times faster. But still, if you have a large paragraph, and if you start resizing your window, without any word caching, you end up reshaping all the time. And it's, it's the nature of open type that is contextual. You need to shape the whole thing to know what the output is. Now, we are adding some API in HalfBuzz that allows for some optimizations. Like it can tell you, so the first time you shape things, and then HalfBuzz can tell you, well, here and here, 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 it's safe if you break the text, the shaping doesn't change, so you don't need to reshape. But, but that API is harder to use. The easiest is uh, to detect that if you break at the word boundaries, the shaping doesn't change. And if that is the case, then use a word cache. Yes, uh, there's no reason that that can't live in HalfBuzz itself, but Anytime you start caching, like there's a lot of factors that come in and when to purge and stuff. So right now, Chrome, Firefox, Android all have their own uh, caches. Yeah. I had uh, sorry, one more question. It was a little more general. Uh, when you were talking about in 2012, I think you were talking about how you were improving the quality of the index shapers, and you would uh, test all these all these words and see how you can print it direct right. And then sometimes you would find the bug in direct right and you would fix it mm -hmm. plus, or separate. And I'm wondering like how do you know uh, the ground truth about like how to shape an index font? Like what is the, the place that you go to to know like this is the correct way to fit those words together? So the question is how do we know uh, what's the ground truth when shaping index? There is no ground truth. What Microsoft does is how you do it, because that's what font designer sees. So the assumption is font designer tests with Windows and tweaks the font to get what they expect. And now there are things that font designers complain about that they can't do with Windows, and sometimes we do things differently to allow them to do better. So a good example is in in index, there's this concept of syllables, which is similar to syllables in other scripts, but because index is so complicated, the open type features are applied one syllable at a time, so uh, within the syllable. So two, two neighboring syllables cannot interact. That simplifies it for the font designers when they are doing their complicated things, but it also means that two neighboring syllables cannot interact. You can't have contextual ligatures between them or even spacing adjustments. So in half buzz, we do allow that. It's, a, it's a, like a deviation from Microsoft that we did intentionally because it enables uh, typographic features that are not otherwise possible. So yeah, we do. Uh, our, our goal is same fonts should behave as like similarly or better, where better is clearly justified. The worst thing is the same font ren renders differently. One of them is correct, the other is wrong. No more questions? Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned HPOT font. Mm -hmm. What is it? HPOT font. Uh, so what is HPOT font? So historically, HalfBot implements just the shaping parts of OpenType, and it doesn't involve itself in uh, the more basic things that FreeType does, or Windows does, or Mac does, which is load the glyph shape and get the basic metrics of the glyph shape and the character to glyph mapping. So some of the base uh, functionality of fonts. Uh, for that, we half was always called out to some other layer because the reason is when you're on Windows, you want to use font metrics that Windows provides because otherwise, because hinting, for example, changes those things. So you want to match exactly what the system platform does. 
but when you are on Android or high DPI or these days everyone is switching over disabling hinting at least for layout uh, so HBOT5 is an implementation of those platform callbacks within Harpoz itself. Now the benefit is because we are like uh, we are skipping a lot of layering instead of going to Windows or Free Type or well, or Skia or Cairo, we are skipping caches and it's just tighter code, typically faster and more efficient. So yes, it's, it's an implementation of what normally platforms provide to Harpoz within half of itself, if that makes any sense. Does this copy and paste your uh, It does if you are not, uh, yes or no. It replaces free type if you don't need to render anything. For example, if you are generating PDF. So for example, style, you know style? Uh, it's a text layout engine uh, tech replacement that uses half was on free type to generate PDF, it can actually use HBOT font and it's significantly faster. Now there's some missing parts, for example, with open type CFF flavored fonts, the glyph metrics are not implemented in HBOT font. Normally you don't need those, but in some situations you do. Um, uh, so yeah, it's not complete, but for modern fonts, it's a replacement and it's typically faster and smaller. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there's the job that you need to completely fix in that story, and does it have any future, the rasterization that you need? Mm -hmm. So, how does Gleefy fit into this story? Huh. Oh. So, Gleefy is a GPU-based rasterizer for fonts, uh, so they're completely separate things. The half bus part is half bus works on the CPU. Text comes in, font comes in, list of glyph out, list of glyphs, list of position glyphs goes out. Now to show them, it's the rasterizer and the graphics engine's job. Typically. Historically, free type rasterizers on the CPU, you upload them in a texture and manage them. Now, Gleefy was one way to do everything on the GPU, and it doesn't do any sampling, it does like every pixel re renders itself at every frame. Now, it was a good proof of concept, it showed what's possible, but it's extremely heavy on the hardware, and it's very, tricky, uh, on every driver and operating system you want, you try it, you have to fix bugs before it works. So, they are completely independent, that's a nice part. The other nice thing is, since Gliffy was done, there have been other uh, approaches to the same problem that are much lighter, much faster, well, they have their own problems, but that's an ongoing uh, field of research, actually, still. And there's some promising things coming out. The latest one is called the uh, MSDF, Multi-Channel Sign Distance Field. It's amazing how it works. It's the shader is like really small, like a few lines. But uh, in my opinion, uh, some system eventually will glue something like Gliffy or a simpler version to, so you use that on the GPU, but for regular font sizes and small sizes, you do want to cache things in a regular texture the way we do today. But all of that rasterization and caching can, ha can happen on the GPU itself. Uh, we haven't seen any system uh, fully exploit the GPU rasterization yet, but it's a completely sep separate problem. In fact, uh, so one of the things that combining half and and Gliffy uh, does is do real text without free type. It's not completely there yet, but uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, my, my, my word, uh, my secret plan is to replace free type. <laughs> <laughs>
No, for modern fonts. Free type has a lot of code that deals with a lot of old font formats, but we don't we don't need to support them forever. So uh, the the things that we put in half was are the the modern parts of open type uh, that modern fonts should be using. We have been adding slowly to half was. Any last question? No. Good. Thank you. <laughs>